There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between radio and bar talk, between commentary and recaps, and it lies between the pit of man's Netflix subscriptions and the summit of his binge-watching ability. This is the dimension of podcasting and the Twilight Zone. These are the Zonisodes. And now your hosts, Brandon Davis and Scott McFarland. Hello everyone out there in podcast land. Welcome to the Front Row Movie Review is the podcast for people who actually like movies, and in this case, TV. And welcome to the sixth Twilight Zone episode in our Zonisodes reviews. Brandon and I are going to be going through all 156. It should take us about 20 years to get done. And here we are in episode six. So as I already mentioned, uh, I'm Scott McFarlane, and with me today is... Brandon Davis, and uh, we're actually going at a much better pace than I thought we would. So <laughs> we're, be- we're being consistent. We're, we're every Friday... Uh, except for when it's not Friday and it's Saturday, but around that time, every time, we're being consistent. <laughs> yeah, as long as we're consistent, I don't care how long it takes. So <laughs> uh, be, be careful on that. You may, as we may find in this episode, you're going to get what you ask for. <laughs> Speaking of that, we are Good on segue. episode. Yeah, exactly. I'm all about transitional material. We are on episode six, which is Escape Clause, which aired November 6th, 1959. Brandon, you want to get us started with a little uh, word from Rod? Yeah, this is one of the, actually, this is one of the shortest ones we've had so far, but you're about to meet a hypochondriac. Witness Mr. Walter Bedeker, age 44, afraid of the following. Death, disease, other people, germs, draft, and everything else. He has one interest in life, and that's Walter Bedeker. One preoccupation, the life and well-being of Walter Bedeker. One abiding concern about society, that if Walter Bedeker should die, how will it survive without him? Oh, yes. How will it? How will it? (laughs) In our synopsis for this lovely little genre through soul buying is Walter Bettiger, as we already heard, is a Howard Hughes wannabe who believes the world and all its germs are out to get him. All he really wants to do is live forever and abuse his wife. In walks Ted uh, Caldwalter, the devil, who offers him immortality for his soul. Walter takes the deal only to find out that he is just as much a dick when he's immortal as when he is mortal. Am I wrong? (laughs) No, you're not wrong. (laughs) After finding that life is too boring for him, he starts trying to kill himself and taking the insurance money. He later takes credit for killing his wife and looks forward to riding the lightning to see if it's any fun. Unfortunately for him, his judge is not a fan of capital punishment, so he's sentenced to life, or in this case, eternity, in prison. Walter decides that won't do, so he uses his escape clause in his contract, allowing the devil to kill him. No loss for anyone there. (laughs) <laughs> that sums it up very well <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of Walter <laughs> yeah he's I, I think he's probably the most evil person we've seen so far in the Twilight Zone and that's saying a lot we've, we've dealt with death we've yes. dealt with gunmen and now <laughs> we have Walter the dick and Walter <laughs> takes the cake over death and gunslingers <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not complaining with that. I agree. <laughs> yeah, he is just, uh, yeah. I, uh, Dave, David Wayne plays him brilliantly, I will say. Um, but yeah, this guy has no redeeming qualities at all. I think even some of the villains that you'll see throughout the Twilight Zone have at least something likable about them, whereas Walter has nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's kind of the point. But yeah. before, before we delve into this wonderful, uh, I don't even know what to call it, uh, let's get our first impressions. Brandon, what do you, what, what do you um, take away from this episode? Have you Do you remember seeing it before? Is this the first time? Uh, and uh, what do you think about it? This was one I don't think – this one it really isn't in the syndication package a whole lot when, they, when they're rerun, I don't feel like. Um, I, what, what struck me about it is for such a – dark subject matter it's really one of the most sort of lighthearted toned 
episodes we've seen so far. Like every everything is so laid back and breezy in this episode that you really wouldn't. <laughs> You even get the vaudeville music in it too. <laughs> but I will say it's it's interesting. It's very um, it's it's a totally unique episode from what we've seen so far in the uh, construct of what Rod Serling's been doing so far. And um, it, what what's interesting is I read a little piece of tri trivia here that this was actually one of the three episode package. This being um, this episode, Mister Denton on Doomsday, and then The Lonely, which we'll be talking about next week was actually the three episode package that Serling presented to potential sponsors for the show. So these are the it's part of the three episode package that sold it to certain sponsors. So that's interesting. But if you look at the other two, he really gave them a good variety of what the show is about. But but yeah, this is really a unique unique episode and really sort of, you know, deals with one of the main themes that we talk about in Twilight Zone, getting what you wish for and how it's not always what it's cracked up to be. Um but once again, I think casting wins the day here. Um, he he really casts some interesting people, and uh, I also think it's interesting that you know we've had very simple names for people like Fate and Death, and he's gone all the way from those simplistic names to <laughs> Cadwallader. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, I actually I, I enjoyed going back and and looking at this episode. Um, well. Well, when we get toward the end and talk about our uh, rankings for this show, though, I don't know that it's quite the highest quality we've seen so far. But, um, yeah, but, it, but, but on, the, on the first viewing, it's fun to watch. Yeah, you know, and I, I'm the guy who's seen, I think, all of them, um, and I've gone through them. But I say I think now because I honestly don't remember seeing this episode before. Yeah. I'm sure I have, but I don't remember it, uh, and that may say something right there there about the episode uh but for me uh it, it's it, i i i'm a person who latches on to characters um and that's why i really enjoy drama and i i really why i like this series a lot because the characters really pop in almost every single episode mm -hmm. and in that case um i know what rod was going for here and making this guy a complete and total dick yeah. but in doing that i have no connection to him at all i just want no. him to die <laughs> So, so you know, when he's when he's stuck in the, the jail cell and just kind of having to experience the fact that he's going to be stuck for the rest of thousands and thousands of years, yeah, I don't care, and that 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 kind of takes a little bit of the weight off. But the one thing I did catch out of this episode is what you already hit on, and this is our first episode that truly uses dark humor, and yeah. uh, and we'll see more of this as we go along. And I think Rod is really good at using that type of humor. And it's very interesting that, you know, we, again, we have the, the kind of gloopy comedic music, you know, right away, this is going to be a lighter episode because there's no, yeah. there's no bass, There's no doom and gloom. It's just kind of aloof. And um, it kind of sets the tone well for uh, sit back and relax. This is not going to be a heavy hitter and it's not. So that's kind of where I am on it. Uh, Brandon, you kind of already started talking about the cast, but uh -huh. what kind of what what characters, what uh, what actors uh, or actresses stand out for you? Well, I you know you have to start with David Wayne, who um, very prolific stage actor up to this time, and also had been in um, quite a few movies, most of them being um, lighthearted comedies. He was mainly a comedic actor. And um, I, uh, just about five or six years before this, he played, um, funny enough, Marilyn Monroe's sort of boyfriend in um, How to Marry a Millionaire, and um, to a very funny effect in that movie. And um, he's, he was also in Adam's Rib with Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy and um, a lot of different movies. Um, and, of course, probably in terms of pop culture, most famously a decade later was playing Mad Hatter on 60s Batman. Um, <laughs> That's where I got him from. <laughs> and uh, I will run into a lot of Batman villains in the show. Um, and the <laughs> uh, Burgess. I'm just waiting for Burgess. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be that long till we get there. No, but, uh, two weeks actually. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> But no, I uh, he's he's doing really the best with what's given to him. He wasn't really given a very three dimensional character here, and uh, so he's you can tell he's trying to give him 
some levels, but you know they're they're hard to come by. Uh, I mean, just in the way that he treats his wife, and in the way that he talks to all these all these various people. But um, I, I, I do think he does do the best with what he's given. And uh, you know, as I said, this is not one of the A list Twilight Zone scripts, but I think he makes it at least somewhat memorable just because he's really good at playing a person with no redeeming value. <laughs> yeah, and you know. I recognize him as the Mad Hatter. Uh, yeah. And the other guy um, who plays the devil, Cod- Codwater. Tom, uh, Thomas, Thomas Gomez. Gomez. Uh, I didn't recognize him, but I recognized his voice. And I finally yeah. figured it out. And that is his last credit was from Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Which yeah. I, am, I am a huge, and I don't know if you know this, so classics coming up maybe. I am a huge fan of the, the Ape series, like all of them. Oh, uh, okay. the original, cool. the ori- not yeah. Tim Burton. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> the good Planet of the Apes, and I think all of them, are, all of them are redeeming in some way. Uh, yeah. So when I heard his voice, I was like, ah, he's a, one of the he's one of the uh, the humans uh, from uh, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, and so that's yeah. where I got his voice from. Yeah, well, my um, I I knew I recognized him from somewhere too, and uh, he's in one of my favorite movies. We haven't talked about it on classics, but uh, Key Largo. He plays um, one of Edward G. Robinson's sort of goons, gangsters in that movie, and uh, he he was he turns up in a lot of those old Warner Brothers gangster movies because he just has that very imposing presence and face and everything. And uh, yeah, I mean, he he really adds a lot to this episode too. I think that. Uh, the, the casting of David Wayne and him is what makes this episode at least somewhat memorable. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a given that, you, you know, if you're going to be a mafioso, you have to be over 300 pounds, right? Yeah. Okay. And with yeah. greasy hair. Yeah, true. <laughs> now, and I agree with you. I think the one scene that works for me in this uh, is the scene where they're together for the first time and they're doing yeah. the contract. That little two person, basically short play of the devil making a guy want to sign a contract is well scripted uh, yeah. and the actors are doing a good job. I, I wish the rest of the episode was like that. And uh, it's funny if, if uh, you look at it in contrast to the two person scene that we had a few episodes ago with Ed Wynn and Murray Hamilton, totally mm-hmm. different tone. Yes. Because, because Ed Wynn is a totally sympathetic character and David Wayne is anything but. So well, I, uh, and I I would argue yeah. that Death was a sympathetic character in that one too. Yeah. He was just trying to do his job, whereas in the Devil is yeah. being the Devil. <laughs> the devil, yeah. And a package that you wouldn't necessarily associate with the Devil, but uh, yeah, just um, really really fun. Uh, he does some really funny, you know, shtick in that scene too. You know, when he's you know stamping the contract and everything, and uh, you know all that smoke you know, pops out and everything, you know, they're, they're, and Serling's trying to add some humor into this that, you know, doesn't always work, but, uh, the, the, the stuff that does is good. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, one of the things that didn't work for me is the wife. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think, uh, you know, she, the actress, Virginia Christine, isn't uh-huh. given much of anything to work with. Yeah. And so I, I feel for her for that. Uh, mm-hmm. but she's basically there to be the doting wife and to, yeah. To trip herself off a roof? I'm I'm not entirely sure how that worked. Yeah, uh, <laughs> she's a klutz. Yeah, she's a. I mean, she she shows up in certain movies um, in the '60s, and she she's really good at playing um, playing nasty parts. Like she plays this sort of overtly racist character and guest who's coming to dinner, um, mm-hmm. who's who's totally against Sidney Poitier marrying Catherine Hepburn's daughter. Um, she also plays kind of this. Um, Nazi sympathizing maid and judgment at Nuremberg, um, and so yeah, so she she, she was evil. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> so, so yeah, but uh, she had an interesting career after this. But uh, yeah, this part really doesn't give her a whole lot to do. See, about two minutes into the movie, uh, the, the the movie, about two minutes into the show, I'm hoping that she takes a pillow and smothers this guy. So that would be redeeming for me if she did that. Or yeah. maybe uh, put some put some of that ammonia into his uh, elixir before he became immortal and just uh-huh. let it run its course, you know. Then yeah. he'll have some pain. Yeah, I. Um, it's interesting seeing though the different series of events he does, trying to you know 
beat death and everything. I think, you know, I think the subway scene is probably the most dramatic. Um, well, it's the only one we get. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> we, we know he's tried to kill himself 14 times once with a yeah. bus. Uh, yeah. And and then you got the moments of like him trying to see if he, you know, has pain or not putting his hands on the radiator and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I mean, if he wasn't going to go to jail for killing his wife, he was going to go to jail for insurance fraud at this point, uh -huh. wasn't he? I mean, oh, he's, yeah. got, he's got a line of guys out the door trying to give him checks for, you know, hitting him with large objects. So sooner oh, yeah, or later, totally. somebody's going to catch on to this guy's a huckster. Yeah, and, and actually, I, I was thinking about it. This might be the most the different ch changes of location we've seen in a Twilight Zone episode so yeah, far. You may be most right. of them have been pretty. Most of them have been pretty stationary, but we have, you know, his apartment, the top of the roof. We have the courtroom, the jail cell, the subway station. <laughs> So there's a lot of, I mean, maybe in walking distance, just because he goes around oh, to so many yeah. different places. But, but I don't think, I don't think we've had this many dramatic changes of locale. In yeah, yeah. In terms of sets, you're right. Um, so you can tell the budget's getting bigger. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's interesting because, uh, as you just pointed out, this is one of the first three scripts that he had, or at least ideas that he had. Yeah. So uh, it is uh, it is uh, interesting to see that. And I think uh, we're going to see that more as we go along, that the production value is going to go up. They're going to have more budget to play with. Um, and I, I think once the powers that be, uh, initially for this season more so, I think it's just them getting settled in. But mm -hmm. when we get farther into this season, and definitely in the season two, you'll, we'll be able to see that um, – the powers that be understand that this show is going to be around for a while so they can invest some yeah. money into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you, you're right. We are starting to see that here. And uh, just looking at the uh, stats of the episode, this episode was directed by Mitchell Lyson, who had just directed 16 millimeter shrine. So it's interesting, the different tones of those two episodes and that he was able to uh, take these two different scripts and do something completely different with them. Whereas, you know, Ida Lupino's character, you know, our protagonist is totally sympathetic and, you know, David Wayne is unsympathetic and, you know, one's more dramatic in tone, one's more comedic in tone. So Serling's sort of roster of directors he has really are able to balance a whole lot of different scripts in their hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and it's always interesting. And that's one of the things I like about TV is especially TV that from, you know, the 20th century, we'll say, um, yeah. is just the the guerrilla style that sometimes had to be done to get things done in time. Mm -hmm. I mean, this show being one of them, where you're you're you you have a director who probably just finished that episode and mm -hmm. immediately jumps into this one. Uh, the fact that you only have a few days to shoot and then you're in editing and then you're turning it around. So uh, sometimes that makes shows fall apart, and sometimes you get some pure cinematic, if you want to call it that, gold. Well, and especially these filmed dramatic shows, because if you hear interviews and stuff, the, the schedules for them are just nuts, um, mm -hmm. you know, having to get so much done in, in uh, one week or whatever. Um, you know, if you're doing like a sitcom in front of a studio audience, that's, per that's a pretty easy schedule from what you hear. You know, you come in, you rehearse, then you film it in front of an audience and you get a couple of days off. But uh, hour long dramas, you know, and this show wasn't an hour yet, but film shows, <laughs> they had... <laughs> They have, a, you know, they have crazy sometimes seven day schedules, which are just nuts. And they sometimes they say if you have a big scene with a lot of cutting, you're up, you know, you know, pretty much from sun up to sundown, and sometimes to sun up again, trying to get stuff done in order to meet the network demands. So, um, and and back at this time, you know, seasons were composed of twenty five to thirty, sometimes thirty five episodes, as opposed to the. 15 episodes a season is comprised of today. So, um, as we can probably tell by the fact that we're talking about TV history more so than the episode, <laughs> there isn't much to talk about in this episode. <laughs> I was trying to give filler. <laughs> like, we got to hit that 20 minutes. So, Brandon, <laughs> let's, let's just cut to the chase here. Uh, before we get into our ranking here, our, our score, uh, what are some closing thoughts that you have for uh, the escape clause? You know, it's, it's an early episode of the Twilight Zone, and Serling is experimenting. He's trying to see what themes work, what themes don't. 
um, what tone works. And I think as we the series matures, um, you'll see more layering of characters and not so much, you know, just, you know, cookie cutter characters. And uh, I think that uh, a lot of the characters we get in this are pretty stationary cookie cutter characters. Although, as you see, just the episode before this walking distance, you see totally fleshed out characters and that Serling was able to do that. So I think he's just still sort of, you know, feeling his oats and um, really sort of trying to um, experiment here. And like, and like I said, this isn't, this, this isn't a bad episode necessarily. I think we've seen, you know, although this might be, I don't know, this might be the, the least strongest episode we've seen in the series so far, maybe. Um, but it's a noble attempt for an early, an early season episode, I think. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with everything you just said. I think, um, part of this is when you have one man or one, anybody writing almost every single episode for a show, mm -hmm. uh, they can put some time into some, some episodes and mm -hmm. some episodes just have to go pretty quick. And I think this is probably one of the ones where Rod realized that he had, uh, a certain amount of time, and he wrote a very quick, uh, dialogue-heavy script and called it a day. Um, the couple of things that stand out for me, I think, is the the fact that this this theme is a good one, and the mm -hmm. fact of again, as you started out talking about, be careful what you wish for, and also the the theme of eternity uh, and what that could mean. Uh, it will be hit on again, and I hit on better in episodes to come. Uh, in fact, in two weeks, we'll kind of hit on it again. Uh, yeah. And um, it, it, I, I think if this episode was given a little bit more time to kind of marinate and find itself before it was filmed, it mm -hmm. probably could have been a stronger episode because it's all there. It's just yeah. the, the, the characters lack luster. Uh, the, the supporting characters, aside from the devil, are written to be just kind of cookie-cutter uh, yeah. And it's just, um, it, it's kind of a blink and you miss it kind of up an episode, but yeah. it's still, it's still not a terrible episode. We will run into terrible episodes. This is not a terrible episode. Uh, yeah. So that all being said, let's go ahead and give it our scores. And uh, again, our scores are one to 10 uh, and we base it in comparison to other Twilight Zone episodes. So one is one of the worst uh, Twilight Zone episodes of all time. And 10 is one of the greatest episodes of all time. And a five is an average Twilight Zone episode. So that being said, Brandon, where do you uh, have Escape Clause fall into your uh, score? It's not a complete bomb, but I still think it's a below average Twilight Zone episode. So I'm... Because it just... It doesn't do much for me. I'm going to give it a three. Yeah, I'm going to go one step lower than you. And I'm going to say this is the worst one yet. Or the so far, and I'm gonna give it a good old two, uh, two. because um, I again I have a built-in bias. I know what's coming, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so I I probably am artificially deflating some of these, but it's because I know how good this show can be, and so when I see a stinker, it's a stinker. <laughs> yeah, I was I, I was trying to debate because so far my lowest ranking I gave Mr. Denton a four, and I said Mr. Denton's a better episode than this, so I've got to yeah. at least give it a three. Well, and yeah. I gave I gave one for the Angels, I think a three, if I remember right. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. And this is a better I mean, one for the Angels is a better episode, mainly just yeah. because of Edwin. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. I and the fact that I cared about his character, and I even cared mm -hmm. about Death more than I cared about Walter. And that, yeah. that says a lot about Walter, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so that is going to uh, wrap things up for this episode uh, in uh, our, our look at an escape clause. Next week, we're going to be looking at another episode that deals with life imprisonment, but uh, very much differently, and that is The Lonely. Uh, so until then, you can find us at the Front Row Movie Reviews, uh, and uh, please go ahead and... Like and subscribe if you're looking at us on YouTube. Uh, if you're listening to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever uh, podcast uh, pr platform you use, please make sure you subscribe to us there. Uh, we'll be coming out with these once a week. And 
Front Row also has some amazing, uh, well, uh, amazing, uh, some some great shows, in ter- including Brandon's Classics, uh, my flashbacks, and a whole bunch of other stuff that the guys at the Front Row and a few of the women we were actually just joking on our Logan review that we probably should have a little bit more diversity in the group. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to work on that. <laughs> but uh, until then, um, my name's Scott, and with me is... Brandon Davis. And should I give Rod's closing? Oh, yes. Here? See, this is what happens uh, when, I, when, I, when I host a show, we fail. Uh, go ahead and close this out with Rod, please. Sure. There's a saying, every man is put on earth, condemned to die. Time and method of execution unknown. Perhaps this is as it should be. Case in point, Walter Bedecker, lately deceased, a little man with such a yen to live, beaten by the devil by his own boredom, and by the scheme of things in this, the Twilight Zone. And with so that, we will we will sign up from there. Yeah. Yes. And with that, until next time, we will see you on the couch. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to this episode of Zonisodes. Zonisodes is a special presentation of the Front Row Movie Reviews podcast. For more information, go to www.thefrontrowmoviereviews.com.